Please pray with me. Oh God, as we pause today to remember those in the military who have given their lives for the freedoms we enjoy, and all those who have died in war in every home and nation, we also lift up all who have died from the plague of gun violence in our land. We remember those who have taken their own lives with a gun, those who have died in school shootings and other mass shootings, those who have died by a gun in the course of an argument or from abuse or by accident or during the commission of a crime. We lift our voices in sorrow and frustration, knowing that every life is infinitely valuable to you. Receive all who have died in the arms of your mercy, bless those who mourn with the hope of eternal life, and strengthen all of our hearts and our arms to bring an end to this forge. This we pray in the name of the one who overcame the power of death, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please. The news from Uvalde, Texas, sits heavy on our hearts. The loss in a school shooting of 19 fourth graders and their two teachers, and the wounding of 17 others, is sadly only the latest in a too long list of tragedies. In some of the litanies for gun violence, that I have found that have been distributed by the bishops against gun violence in the Episcopal Church. I counted 64 mass shootings, and they didn't mention Columbine. The streets of heaven are too crowded with angels. President Jed Bartley said that in the 2006 West Wing episode after a similar shooting in the drama. We are all victims of gun violence. Not just those innocent <coughs> school children or shoppers or concert goers or office workers or worshipers. Not just those who lost their lives to gun violence and all those who loved and mourned them. Our nation's gun crisis also affects police officers and other first responders, emergency medical teams, all those who help provide training for and counseling after mass shootings, all those who dive under their desks in active shooter drills, and all of those who come to think that this kind of threat is just part of life. We are all held as prisoners, in fear, in mourning, in preparation, in drills for horrific events that we should never, ever have to anticipate. And so the news and the social media, as you know, have been full of calls for gun legislation, for change, legislation, confiscation, elimination. And those who support gun ownership, including the lobbyists and the many politicians and citizens they influence, have been equally vocal that the other side's gun control suggestions will not work. One of the things I hear commonly is the only thing that will stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So no matter where we fall on this broad spectrum of how to stop gun violence, I really don't believe that anyone among us supports the horrific outcomes of our failed policies. What we do know is that we have a terrible problem. The United States has more mass shootings and deaths by gun violence than any other nation in the world. And for every time we hear or say that we send our thoughts and prayers, we know in our hearts that we need policy and change that is, thoughts and prayers in action. As Pope Francis often says, first you pray for the hungry, then you feed them. That's how prayer works. Years ago, 
when I was a young lawyer, a bill was introduced in the Georgia legislature that outlawed a type of financing lease that allowed cities to borrow money for essential services and essential, not essential services, but essential equipment and buildings to build schools, governmental buildings. It allowed that without a bond referendum. And there were really, really good public purposes for this financial tool. And there had also been a number of abuses. And cities had entered into these leases they couldn't afford to keep but couldn't function without. It's not important to understand how they worked, just that they were an important tool and they had been used thought thoughtlessly. Something had to be done, but we could not agree on what it was. The committee room at the Georgia House was filled with bond lawyers, with local delegations of mayors, city managers, council members, and taxpayers, all earnest and concerned with notebooks and Georgia codes and books all over the place. We're all explaining why the legislation that had been introduced would not work. I was in that meeting room, and I have never forgotten what the committee chair said to us. I hear all your good reasons why this bill we have introduced won't work, he said. But these leases are a problem, and we have been talking about this for a very long time. You all get together and write something that will work, or we're just going to get rid of these things. Is that approach too simplistic to imagine in the context of gun control? Maybe. But it sure clarified what was at stake, and it motivated us to get past our differences that we all believed were insurmountable to find the best outcome for us all. And just to be clear, like the gun lobby, we were financially interested. There were economic interests involved. All the bond lawyers like me and the bankers and the financial advisors, we supported our families with this municipal lease work. And the cities were able to finance essential equipment and facilities, get a fire truck that they needed to keep people safe, that they couldn't do any other way. But the committee chair's ultimatum that we establish our own reasonable limitations to control the abuses of this financing vehicle or lose our economic interests altogether focused our thinking. And we surprised ourselves. We were freed from the system of domination by our economic interests, and we figured it out. What if we put our loudest and strongest thoughts and prayers in action, insisting that our legislators introduce strong gun control legislation with the United Will to pass it, and let those who support gun ownership for good reasons, including both gun owners and the well-funded gun lobby who stand to lose their economic control over others, let them figure out, all of us together, figure out reasonable regulations to free us from this system of domination by economic interests. We must call on them to try, because the streets of heaven are just too crowded with angels. We see economic stakes like this at play in today's reading from Acts. When Paul heals a young girl who is making her owners a fortune, a lot of money, by telling people's fortunes. She follows Paul and the other apostles around for several days, annoying them by repeating endlessly that they are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Well, everything she says is true, of course, but she was also a victim of her owner's economic exploitation. When Paul frees her, casts out the demon, and releases her from this system of domination, her owners take Paul and Silas to the government authorities, where they're stripped and beaten and thrown into prison. <coughs> As preacher Bromley McClenahan writes, when God's power is revealed over and against the power of businessmen to exploit a young girl, 
and over and against Rome's power to imprison agitators and evangelists, doors break open. In the words of preacher Ron Hansen, there is an earthquake that jars loose the doors of the jail and somehow unhinges the framework, holding Paul and Silas in prison. Paul and Silas, as a Roman jailer, is also free from the imprisonment that binds both captives and captives in every system of human domination. The Roman jailer is baptized in his whole household with him liberating all of them at the same time. Like the Roman jailer, we are all, all victims of gun violence. May we pray actively, working with God to unhinge the framework of gun violence that is holding us imprisoned. 